1 Peter 5, verse 8 and 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Spiritual warfare is a natural part of the believer's life. The enemy, the devil, always seeks for an opportunity to attack us. But what should we do when the enemy attacks us? Should we stand helpless and plead with the enemy for mercy? The Bible says to be vigilant. That is, we must be careful to watch out for the attacks of the devil. He has no two businesses other than seeking whom to devour. Peter exhorts us to remain clear-headed, sober, and watchful, vigilant. Because Satan has not yet been bound and restrained. At the present time, the devil walks about this world. Hollywood portrays the devil being in hell and being in charge of hell, raising the temperature on people and poking people with a pitchfork. The devil is not in hell. He is very much here on this earth, wandering, walking back and forth, looking, seeking like a roaring lion, ready to devour those whom he can. We must resist him. And how? by standing firm against him and being strong in faith. In other words, we are not permitted to run from the devil, we are to fight back. Put on the armor of God. Put on the armor of God and take a stand in the name of Jesus Christ. Put on the armor of God and give no ground to the enemy. Put on the armor of God and don't take a step back. Ephesians 6 verse 13 to 17 Wherefore take unto you the whole armour of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Armour is a protective layer worn over the body against the penetration of bullets by military officers while on the battlefield. Believers are on the battlefield against the devil and his army. We must not go bare to face the devil. We have spiritual armor for our spiritual battles, and the armor is of God. Therefore it can never fail if rightly used. When we put on the armor of God, we can stand against all fiery darts of the wicked. Unfortunately, many people try to fight the enemy under their own power and their own strength. This is not a smart move considering the fact God left us the armor we require to engage and defeat the enemy. If you attempt to stand and face the enemy on your own, the enemy will do unspeakable things to you. He will destroy you if you attempt to face him in your own power and in your own might. Ephesians 6 verse 14 to 17 gives us a list of our defensive weapons to halt all the attacks of the enemy targeted against us. Truth, righteousness, the preparation of the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, and the word of God. Now, who are the types of people that demons fear? Demons fear those who have taken their position in Christ. John 1 verse 12 says that all who receive Christ have been given the power to become the children of God. God is not under the devil. His children are not supposed to suffer a defeated life too. I repeat, God is not under the devil. 
His children are not supposed to suffer a defeated life too. Stop seeing yourself as a victim. Stop seeing yourself as a loser. Stop believing that life is against you. You are a child of God. We are God's children. Therefore, act like it. More so, we are co-heirs with Christ. The Bible says in Romans 8 verse 16 and 17 that we are God's children. Therefore, we are his heirs and joint heirs with Christ. Unfortunately, many believers do not know who they represent in Christ. No wonder the devil bullies them because of their ignorance. Hosea 4 verse 6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Are you being destroyed by the enemy because you don't know who you are and whose you are? You are a son of the king. You are a daughter of the king. One of the ways people are destroyed by Satan and evil spirits is through condemnation. Satan and evil spirits will come and quite literally beat you on your head with your past and past sins. Satan and his evil demons will make you feel as if you are going to hell because you haven't reached some unreachable standard of righteousness. Satan and his evil demons will torment you with thoughts that you are going to hell. You are going to hell because you are not good enough. This is why you take your position in Christ. Because Christ came and died for people who are not good enough. Jesus Christ came and died for people who are not perfect. And this is what you need to know. Jesus Christ came and died for broken, messed up people like me and you. And I am not going to heaven because of my own righteousness. I am going to heaven because of his righteousness. That is what you need to remember. It is not what I did, but Jesus Christ did. Praise God. This is a call to you. This is a call to every child of God. Take up your position in Christ. Take up your position in Christ. Don't listen to your feelings. Listen to the word of God. Take up your position in Christ. James 4 verse 7, Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. This is the type of person Satan fears and his demons. He fears those who submit to God. Submitting to God is obeying his word and commands. Submitting to God is accepting and acknowledging that God knows best. Submission to God is yielding to the Holy Spirit and His work in your life. Submission to God is to be uncompromising about your faith. And that is the type of people that Satan fears and his demons fear. They fear those who are dogmatic about the Word of God. That is true Bible faith. True Bible faith is dogmatic. It is uncompromising. True Bible faith doesn't care what the world says. It doesn't care what their family or friends say. It sticks to the Word of God and the Word of God purely. A person who submits to God is an upright person. A person who submits to God seeks righteousness and holiness, a peace with all of mankind. A person who submits to God shuns evil. A person who submits to God lives a Job type of life, a life of total commitment to the Lord, a life of total faithfulness. Though the wind may blow, the waves may rise, I will stay with the Lord. And that is the type of people that Satan fears, the people who have made a commitment to walk with God just like Enoch. Now the reason Satan and his demons fear this type of people is not because they have some supernatural glory only unique to them. The reason demons fear this type of people is because they fear God Almighty. James 2 verse 19, You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. 
No demon fears a person, but they fear God. They fear him. Stick with God. He is your protector. He is your shield. Look what the Bible says. What will happen to you if you move closer to God? James 4 verse 8 Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Come close to the one true God, and he will draw close to you. Look at the story of Job. The devil knew Job. He knew exactly who Job was. But he knew that he could not touch him. God had a hedge of protection around him, and everything that happened to Job only happened because God allowed it to happen. You don't ever have to fear when walking with the Lord. You are protected. You are covered, and anything that does happen will be a result of God allowing it to happen. To walk with God is not unique to only special people. Every day, run-of-the-mill Christians can all walk with God. Submit to Him. Allow God to be the God of every single area of your life. We have a significant position in Christ. Presently, wherever Christ is, is where every believer should assume. Believers have their position with Christ in heavenly places where he sits, far above the dominion of principalities and powers. Isaiah 43 verse 2 When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. We received an email inquiring about marine spirits. It was titled, The Nephilim, Demons of the Marine Kingdom. The email specifically asked if the Bible mentions marine spirits and how marine spirits might be connected to the Nephilim. The short answer is that the Bible does not mention marine spirits. While scripture is rich with spiritual teachings and accounts, it gives no explicit mention of a specific class of demon referred to as a marine spirit. The purpose of this discussion is not to promote or endorse beliefs not found in the Bible. Instead, we aim to explore the origins and evolution of this concept, recognizing that beliefs about marine spirits and similar entities may have roots in cultural, regional, or traditional interpretations and narratives. Throughout history, many beliefs have emerged around the spiritual realm, and some may not align directly with canonical biblical texts. In our exploration, we will consider these varying perspectives and seek to understand them in their historical and cultural contexts, always keeping in mind the Holy Bible as our foundational reference point. From the onset, it is important to state that I personally do not believe in marine spirits, simply because the Bible does not mention them. However, there are many Christian circles that do believe in them. Before we proceed, it is important once more to highlight that the Bible does not specifically mention the term marine spirit. The concept of marine spirits, as commonly understood in some contemporary Christian circles, is not a direct teaching from the canonical texts of the Bible. It is a term associated with beliefs related to demonic oppression and possession. As belief in marine spirits is based on extra-biblical information. As a result, there's a vast and diverse range of teachings and perspectives concerning the nature, characteristics, and actions of a marine spirit. Due to this reliance on sources outside the traditional biblical canon, interpretations can vary widely from one group or individual to another. To understand these beliefs, one must first recognize that the term is predominantly used as a catch-all representing perhaps a myriad of spiritual entities related to water. Rarely is the term marine spirit intended to describe a singular, uniquely identifiable demon, but rather it's utilized to encapsulate a broader spectrum of aquatic-related demonic entities. In simple terms, it's used to describe a wider range of water-related evil spirits. For those who adopt this belief, there's a specific historical and biblical context to which they attribute the origins of marine spirits. A recurring narrative points to the events of the Great Flood during Noah's era. According to the Bible, 
This flood was a cataclysmic event meant to cleanse the earth of its corruption. As the waters rose and submerged the land, every living creature not aboard Noah's Ark perished. Embedded within this narrative is the mention of the Nephilim. The Nephilim, as detailed in the Bible, were seen as giants or mighty warriors, born from the union of the sons of God and the daughters of men. For proponents of the marine spirit doctrine, there's a connection drawn between the Nephilim and these spirits. They suggest that the Nephilim, who were washed away by the floodwaters, transformed or continued their existence as the demons of the marine kingdom. Elaborating further on the characteristics attributed to these marine spirits reveals an even more detailed picture. It is commonly believed within these circles that these spirits have an inherent connection to water, finding discomfort away from it. Luke 11.24 is often cited to support this notion. Luke 11.24.26 When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and finding none, he saith, I will return unto my house whence I came out. And when he cometh, he findeth it swept and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh to him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in, and dwell there and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Luke 11.24 is often cited to support this notion. In this verse, Jesus describes an unclean spirit that, after leaving a person, wanders through dry places in search of rest. While the verse does not directly mention marine spirits, some believers infer a connection, suggesting that this scripture validates the idea that certain demonic entities are intrinsically linked to water and find arid and dry environments tormenting. Another New Testament passage frequently referenced in discussions about marine spirits is the account of Jesus' encounter with a demon-possessed man in Luke 8.26-33. Here, a multitude of demons, referring to themselves as legion, were cast out of a man by Jesus. Post-exorcism, these demons begged to be allowed into a herd of pigs, Upon receiving permission, they entered the pigs, which then plunged into the sea. For some believers, this act is not merely coincidental, but is seen as further evidence supporting the aquatic nature of these demons. They suggest that the legion, in being marine spirits, instinctively sought refuge in their natural watery domain. To reiterate, while these beliefs are prevalent in specific Christian circles, they're not universally accepted. Many theologians and scholars argue against these interpretations or consider them non-canonical. Although the term marine spirits is not found in the scriptures, references to demon spirits, evil spirits, and unclean spirits are found in scripture. Scripture does not shy away from acknowledging the existence of such entities, and neither should you as Bible-believing Christians. Throughout its pages, there are repeated reminders of a world where demonic spirits not only exist, but also interact and influence human lives. Despite the Bible's clear references to these entities, modern society tends to sidestep or outright avoid discussions about demons and demonology. This aversion to spiritual discussions may stem from skepticism, fear, or a myriad of other reasons. The scripture that often captures the attention of many regarding the hierarchy and categories of these spiritual entities is Ephesians 6.12, which states, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This passage penned by the Apostle Paul is particularly illustrative it paints a vivid picture of a multi-tiered spiritual realm populated by entities with varying degrees of power and malevolence. Given the intricate portrayal of the spiritual realm as depicted by Apostle Paul and other biblical writers, it becomes evident that there is a vast expanse in the spirit world that remains beyond our current understanding or comprehension. This spirit realm, teeming with spirit beings, operates in dimensions and dynamics that often escape our human perception. However, you can see their effect in our world. If you look at our world today, you can clearly see that evil is at work. The spiritual realm is neither constrained by our human concepts of time, nor bound by the physical laws that dictate our world. Hence, there is a tremendous amount going on in the spirit world that we do not know about or can barely fathom. These spirit beings, 
some benevolent and others malevolent, have been in existence for ages far longer than any human. Their origins, purposes, and hierarchies are not only ancient but also endowed with wisdom and intelligence surpassing human capacities. They've witnessed ages of history, civilizations rise and fall, and have been active players in the grand cosmic narrative. Paul's nuanced choice of words, from principalities to powers to rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness, suggests an intricate web of spiritual adversaries. This multidimensional aspect of the spiritual realm underscores the complexity of our unseen adversaries. Although these entities may vary in their nature and rank, they share a common objective, to destabilize and disrupt a Christian's faith and spiritual standing. This shared goal aligns them against humanity, and especially against those who profess faith in Christ. Such references are a reminder that demonic forces are real, active, and ever persistent in their efforts to undermine spiritual truths and realities. Fire burns whether you believe it or not. Poison kills whether you believe it or not. The devil is real whether you believe it or not. Demons are real whether you believe it or not. Refuse to be a naive Christian. You are in the middle of a spiritual battle, as we are told by Paul, whether you believe it or not. The Christian life is not a playground, it is a battleground. When discussing these spirits and their classifications, it's worth noting that not every demon is of the same rank or possesses the same level of influence. Some are believed to operate on a more global scale, influencing nations and rulers, while others may work on an individual level, plaguing specific persons with temptations, doubts, and fears. If you honestly believe Jesus is your Lord, if you honestly believe Jesus is your Savior, if you believe that the records of the Gospel are accurate, how then can you believe that demons are not real? There is a very real devil and a very real army of demons. You cannot fight an enemy, which you refuse to acknowledge their existence. Because the truth is, the devil and his demons do not ignore your existence. They know exactly who you are. I once heard a profound statement. I believe when you come to know the Lord, you come to know the devil at the same time. And if someone says, I don't have any experience of the devil, I've never come across the devil. I honestly wonder how far they have gone with the Lord because, as I said in the past, the devil is not in hell tonight, he is in one of the heavens, and we wrestle against the power of evil not in the hellish places, but in the heavenly places, that's where they are. What a profound statement. Contrary to popular belief, the media paints the picture as if Satan and his army are in hell right now, but according to the Bible, that is not correct. The Bible tells us the devil and his army are on this earth, looking and seeking whom to devour. In conclusion, marine spirits are not mentioned in the Bible. Like many scholars, I also do not subscribe to this belief. Instead, a majority of scholars, including myself, believe that the best interpretation we have of Satan's kingdom is found in Ephesians 6.12. It states, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places.